Welcome to the 500th episode of the Author to Authority podcast. And today I am so, so, so thrilled to have as our special guest, Dave Sanderson. Kim, I am, I'm blown away. I've never been to 500th of anything. So thank you so much for allowing me to be with you on such a special, special day, a special episode. Now, Dave is a nationally recognized leadership speaker. He's an accomplished author. He's the inspirational survivor of what is known as the miracle on the Hudson, and we're going to talk about that today. As the last passenger off of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, which had to ditch into the river, he took the lessons he learned from that profound experience in the frigid water. He emerged from the wreckage with a mission to encourage others to do the right thing and share how to bounce back with resiliency to address any Ad adversity they may face. Now, not only is he a nationally recognized speaker, but he's also the author and contributing author of actually four and at least three internationally best-selling books, including Moments Matter, Brace for Impact, From Turmoil to Triumph, and his newest book just released in January, The Limitless Life, which I had the honor of privilege of helping Dave with. Now, after 36 years in sales and sales leaderships with roles in companies such as ADP, PeopleSoft, and Oracle, Dave founded his executive coaching and personal leadership firm, Dave Sanderson Speaks International, on January 15th, 2014. In addition to his 36 years in sales and sales leadership, he was the director of security for Tony Robbins for over 10 years and was recently named one of the top 100, yeah, that's 100 leadership speakers on Inc.com. Over the last 10 years, his talks have raised over 14.8 million U.S. dollars for the American Red Cross. And he lives in Charlotte, North Carolina with Terry, his wife of 37 years, and has four children, Chelsea, Colleen, Courtney, and Chance. Man, that's a lot of C's to try to remember. I didn't get a vote for any of them, Kim. That was my all my wife right there. <laughs> yeah. Dave, welcome to the show. I'm yeah. so glad to have you. Well, thanks again. I'm really excited. Congratulations on 500. That's that's quite an accomplishment. So, congratulations. Well, you know, we've worked together for the last few years now, and and you know, one of the discussions that you and I have on a regular basis is how consistency plays such a role in success. Yeah, I mean, I think even as we were working together on our book projects, it's all about consistency, right? I mean, it's you got to put a discipline together to be able to, I think, to get any outcome you're really committed to. I mean, a lot of people should do things and they should all, all the time. But, you know, with people who make it a must are consistent and have discipline. And that's how things get accomplished. So I, I commend you because you put a, a system in place, a process in place to help me be able to stay consistent and disciplined getting some of our projects done. And then we had Destiny in the background giving you constant reminders. Dave, Dave, it's, Dave. You always you always need a destiny someplace, right? I need I have my I have mine. I have my Kelly's. You've got your destiny. That's correct. Oh, uh, yep. so Dave, let's let's just go back because some people might not know your story. So we, you know, we want to cover your story today. We want to cover. Um, you know, uh, the lessons that you've learned. And um, then we're going to talk actually about the two books that we worked on together. But first, share with me, yep. you know, about that day just over 15 years ago that that radically changed your life. Well, thank you. And Kim, I was so honored you were able to come to New York City on the 15th anniversary and actually see where this happened. It's uh, once, once you see it and actually see it in the in a winter kind of pro, you know, in time of year, so you can actually see the effects. I think it has a lot more impact. But here's the highlights. I wasn't supposed to be on that plane. I was scheduled on a later flight, but I had the opportunity to come home early because our business day got done early. So end of a three-day business trip, I travel a lot. Let's get home. So I wasn't supposed to be on that plane. So you know, I got on the plane. I gave up a first-class seat to go to seat 15A. That's four wings, four rows behind the left wing. And as usual, I didn't pay attention because I know everything. Just like everybody else, I know everything, right? So, you know, I don't know. You know, I just put my head down, start reading a magazine. But 
as we know, about 60 seconds after we took off is when there was an explosion. And that's what got my attention because I never heard an explosion on a plane. So that sort of rocked me a little bit. So I looked out the window and saw fire coming out underneath the left wing. So I knew something had happened. But, you know, I fly so often. I know these planes all have multiple engines. So, you know, okay, the engine got knocked out. We'll go back to the airport. I'm not getting home early. But you know what? We'll go back to the airport. So as it started banking, you know, I started looking out the window. All of a sudden I saw the, the skyline of Manhattan. I'm like, you know, I've never seen this before, right? I'm like, so, so, so that definitely caught my eye. I'm like, I've never seen the skyline of Manhattan as I as I was going in to LaGuardia. And as we started looking out a little further, I saw this bridge coming up. I've never seen a bridge that close up and personal. I'm like, okay, something's going on. And then, of course, right as we start crossing over the George Washington Bridge, that's when I heard the captain say his famous words, this is your captain, brace for impact. And that's when I knew something serious was going to happen. Because you know, when you hear something like that come from the cockpit, and you have no power. You're descending quickly. All you see is a river. There's a bridge. Things start adding up pretty quickly. So that's when I had to start checking in. And, uh, you know, people ask me, what's that like? I said, well, I prayed. First thing I did is I prayed. And I prayed for three things. I prayed whoever the dude is up front, get me down. Whoever the last person I spoke talked to, is, which was is, he was my client over in Brooklyn, to call my wife. I told her I loved her. And the third thing is I prayed to God to forgive my sins. I don't want anything between me and God. We're going down. I want to go up, and it's not looking good right now. So I wanted to make sure I was checked in. And in about 60 seconds after we crossed over the George Washington is when we crashed into the river. And, and it was a hard hit. He estimates he hit between 110 and 120 miles an hour. So it was an extremely hard hit. So we hit, I went back in my seat and up my seat. It was like a jarring hit. When I came back up, I looked up. I looked out the window, and I saw light. So I knew I had a shot. But also, I'm a Christian, and knowing light is good. You know, the light's good, right? It's You don't want to be in darkness, right? We're in darkness enough in our lives. Now we see light, it, we, at least in that, but we know now we have a shot, but it wasn't out. Because as the plane has the plane landed, it sort of hit on the backside first, and water started coming in. And all of a sudden, where I was sitting was about anywhere from ankle to knee deep water immediately. And this is 36-degree water. So it, it's coming in fast. So, you know, my game plan, Kim, I grew up playing sports, as you know, and, you know, I as and playing sports and even in business, even before I went to business, you always have a game plan. What's my game plan? What am I going to get? What do I want to do to execute? And my game plan was aisle up out. So as we were going down that last 60 seconds and aisle up out, aisle up out in my head. So I knew what my game plan was. So when I got to the aisle, I was okay, all right, aisle going up to the door and out. Everything changed because that's when I heard my mom start talking to me. And my mom passed away in 1997. But when I was a child, there was something she would tell me and probably my sister and brother. She probably thought it was all the same thing. If you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And see, one of, as I look back at that, what she said in my head and I heard, my mother never told me. She said, if you do the right thing. It was like she was giving me the choice. And, you know, I could have gone out and that would have been fine. But, you know, the way I was raised is I grew up in a small town where everybody knew each other. And everybody cared about each other, so everybody took care of each other. So instead of going out, I climbed over the seats to go towards the back of the plane just to see if anybody needed help. And things were moving pretty quick. And the water was about chest, leaf, chest deep in the back because the angle of the plane you see on the big picture from the front doesn't show you that actually the back of the plane is actually submerged. It's already submerged. So it's already about chest deep water. So, you know, I, I get behind the last person. I'm making my way out. It's dark. As you remember, it's late afternoon winter in New York, and you're already underwater. So and you had luggage that's left floating in the water. So you're running into things as you're walking out. But the first light that I saw was on the right at 10F. I'm like, I'm out of here. Time to go. But then I, I looked out and I was like, I'm ready to get out of that wing like everybody else. But you look out, that wing was already filled. And the lifeboat right there was filled. And But all of a sudden, people were already being rescued by the ferries. That's why I tell people, whoever said it, got it right when they said that the crew got everybody down that day. The crew and passengers got everybody out, but the real heroes were the first responders. But that's why I was inside the plane, waist deep in 36 degree water for about seven minutes, because the, the, the boat and the wing were already filled up. But then a few minutes later, about six or seven minutes later, there were a lot of things happening. And I mean, there was, you know, I saw a lady on the wing who wasn't moving. There's a lot of things that were going on. But about seven minutes later, I felt the plane rock. And I didn't know what happened, but I found out later one of the, one of the tugboats that was part of the rescue, as he backed out, he hit the front of the plane, which shook the plane, which meant water's going up my back, 
And the first thing I thought was Titanic. I said, oh, that movie, I just saw that movie. Because then when that boat tipped up and it sucked everything in it, I said, man, this thing is going down, man. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here now. And I always stop here and think my mom and dad, because they had made me get swing lessons when I was a child. I mean, able to get off this plane. You see, that's where, where the genesis of my first book or my, my first full book, myself, Moments Matter, came because that's one of those moments you realize these moments are in your life for a reason. You yes. know, that, that moment, my mother made me learn how to swim, and that Boy Scout moment when I had to swim you know, across the river to get to the next activity. Maybe that was there for preparing me for that exact moment because that's when I had to swim to save my life. And that's pretty much a condensed version of what happened. But it's uh, all these moments that add up in our life are there for these certain defining moments. So you can't let any moment in your life go by just thinking it's just there for not for a reason. It's there for a reason. So you were in the plane for quite a few minutes, knee deep, chest deep water. Um, and then, so you, when you got off the plane, you, ha you swam to the ferry. Is, is that correct? Correct. I had to swim and, and I swam as close as I could to that wing. Just so I had, had, I had something to look at, right. I had something there and, you know, it, it, people are, I tell people that's the longest 15 yards from my life. Cause not only was the water 36 degrees and I was fully clothed, but there was yeah. also jet fuel in the water. And that's why Ooh. I wear glasses today. Cause when there's a picture of me in the hospital and all the media that night, they took a picture and I was like having a hard time seeing because they found out when I got back to, to home, I went to the optometrist, I had jet fuel in my eyes and little specks of jet fuel that were causing. So that's why I wore glasses, but I got there though. I got there. And now I'm holding on to the wing, trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And now you don't climb and I yell up can't. Yeah. And then my mom started talking to me again because when I was a child and you said, I can't to my mom, my mother would say, if you can't do it, you're going to do it. You know, and I, after, after all this came out, came as I think, you know, my story, that's where I realized what my mother's worldview was. See, I think everybody's got a worldview about what's, what's their life. What's, what's their life really look like. Yeah. My mother's worldview was, if you can't, you must, because she would never yeah. let any of her kids say that. Cause she did, she believed that if you said, can't, it puts it in your head that you're, you're right. You can't because whatever you say to yourself is true. So I never said that word, but I said it and I heard it. It's like, that's why I got one arm up and the other arm up and started climbing until I couldn't climb anymore. And two, two gentlemen grabbed me and pulled me on the ferry. And that's how I got out of the water to get to the ferry. And that's, uh, well, yeah, because at this point you're hyperthermic, right? Your, your body's yeah. shutting down. And so it would have taken every last ounce of your strength to pull yourself up. And I, I think in those moments, you know, um, you know, God honors that. Like he gives us, he gives us the strength. Um, when I was giving birth to my first uh, child, I had been in labor for a very long time, a very hard, very severe labor. Um, you know, I had been pushing for over two hours, completely, totally, physically, mentally, you know, emotionally exhausted. I had nothing. I had nothing left. And the doctor's telling me I've got to push this kid out who's stuck. And I'm like, God, I can't do this. Like, I just, I can't, I can't. And, you know, all of a sudden it was just like, God, you've got to help me. Like, I don't have anything left in me to bring this child into the world. And, you know, there was just this one moment where I just felt like this surge of strength come. It came from the top of my head. So it's not like a normal place, but literally just top my head through my body. And I pushed my son out. But, you know, in that moment I had nothing. Yep. I had absolutely nothing. And yet, you know, God is faithful. Yeah, I think that um, on that day, and this is my belief only, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but, God said, you served, you served. Yeah. Now you need to be served. So I think that's what, from that point forward is when people started taking care of me. Cause before then it was just mo go, go, go trying to handle the situation. But I think sometimes you just give it up. Say, you know what? I've given it. It happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Likewise, you know, and uh, when I was on another plane and had another plane incident, emergency landing and, you know, I, I gave, gave, gave. And then it came to a point. I said, I, I, I the first captain said, you're pretty resourceful. I said, yeah. But I got to a point where I said, I, I'm out of resourcefulness right now. I just need someone, someone to take care of me. And someone did take care of me. So I believe, I believe what happened to you would have happened to me. You get to that point where you serve to the point where you need help. 
And it's not, it's not, yeah. you're not, you're not uh, weak if you ask for help. You know, you're not no. weak. You just sometimes, you know, like that story of you know, Jacob with God wrestling with Jacob, right? He wrestled, wrestled, wrestled. Jacob did not give up. It's yeah. A, bless me, right? Bless me. And I'll give up. And, you know, God, God respected that. God respected mm-hmm. that. I named a whole, named him after a whole country, right? A whole, whole, whole tribe. So. If you've never heard of the story of the miracle on the Hudson, I recommend you watch the movie Sully. But, you know, that day was incredible because the the first responders, the uh, American Red Cross, the ferry system, the New York Transit Way, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, and then there was also special divers that were um, came yeah. in to play as well. So you've got all of these major organizations from both New York and New Jersey. So my understanding of American geography is not the greatest, but my understanding that's two different states, right? Am I correct in saying that? Two so different all states, of these people, two, two different jurisdictions. Exactly right. So you know, all of these people in less than a half an hour mobilized and got you guys off of that plane. Yeah, and I think one of the things as you heard for the first time in public um, that day when we were together in January, when Gio talked about the plan, and you know that plan that they were developing it was based not on not on a plane. It was based on a, a boat goes down in the Hudson, but that plan was only signed off a week before this happened. And all they did is wow. use a plan that was made a week. I mean, and if I tell people, I actually wrote a story about this because just think if they didn't have that plan together. Yeah, this thing probably would have got pulled off, right? Could have been pulled off, but then then you have two competing, you know, organizations or multi organizations. Who's taking the lead on this? But with the plan that came into play only a week ahead of time, which was revealed that day on the fifteenth of January, twenty twenty four, all of a sudden everybody collaborated, and everybody knew exactly what they had to do at that circumstance. All I did was substitute a, a plane for a boat, and it came together. Yeah. Now, you've written several books, and I've helped you with two of them, but the two books that we worked on, you know, you've shared a lot of lessons, but especially your newest one, The Limitless Life, that was 15 lessons. And so I want to switch gears here from your story to the lessons learned, and I I want you to include the one that you talked about on the 15th for the first time, so the the 1%. Go into that one, too, because that was an amazing revelation. Actually, I think that that needs to be the name of your next book, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- thank you, Kim. Because that day, you know, I, as you know, the backstory because you were with me when I was going to make those final remarks. I already had my final remarks ready to rock. That's the way I do. Th- I plan. Okay, I knew I'm going to say, but all of a sudden, I looked out and saw all these first responding units and all these people who come together just to recognize and celebrate these people who served. I, you know, there were two things that sort of came out. Number one was it, with inclusion, there's a power in unity. And that's something, you know, that was all these different people and different agendas. But second was the power of the one degree, because, you know, if you look at what happened that day and, you know, I, and, I, and I knew a little of the backstory. So I had to have a little point of reference. But then all of a sudden I saw other things come together that day. If, if that plane is one degree, that, that plane, as he's putting this thing down, is one degree to the left. He's toppling through New York City. If yeah. he has, if that thing's just one degree to, to, to the right, it's toppling through Jersey City. If it's one degree, just a little bit down, it's going straight to the bottom of the Hudson. And also I started realizing the power of the one degree, just think one degree of difference of anything changes your entire destiny. Your date with destiny changes. And not only with like in a plane crash, just think, you know, you're one degree away and you're walking on the sidewalk and a car's coming your way. You're one degree away and all of a sudden it misses you. Yeah. So, you know, you got to pay attention. So, well, I guess the big lesson is you've got to pay attention. Because, you know, one degree is one degree in a relationship. Just like, you know, I talk about the six degrees of separation, how all of a sudden your, your relationship can change just with one word. All of a sudden you're, you're, you have one, I'll say one word or one degree, and all of a sudden your relationship's going this way. Yeah. It's, it's amazing of uh, how, how powerful that was. And that was really magnified that day, just on a bigger scale about just, you know, looking at a plane that's going down and ready to crash. And unless that thing's perfect, unless he has some, and I personally believe some divine, given uh, divine overview of that day. That's my belief. You can believe whatever you want, 
But I think it's, uh, you know, God's hands were on that plane and guided that plane down yeah. with the help of a very skillful captain, very skillful captain. Yeah. So what we were talking about is January 15th, 2024 was the 15th anniversary of when the plane went down. And I had the honor of being with Dave in uh, New York, the New York Transit, Waterway Transit. Waterways. Yep. New York Waterways. Yeah. And uh, Dave held a ceremony there celebrating the first responders because there's been a lot of attention over the years um, to the captain and the first officer. There was a lot of attention paid to some different people. But, you know, those first responders really didn't receive the recognition that they deserved. And Dave felt that they needed to be recognized, especially on the 15th anniversary. And so we had a ceremony right where the ferry docked yeah. uh, on the New York side to celebrate the, the first responders. And, and if you Google it, it was on a lot of the news channels and that you could see uh, parts of it. Dave, if you've got a link to it, we'll, uh, we'll put a link to that in the, in the show notes, but you know, after that, and that's where the limitless life. So you've got, you know, your first two books kind of covered just before and during the plane crash. The limitless life kind of covered the end part of the plane crash and then the things that happened afterwards. So, Dave, I would love for you to speak for a few minutes because the limitless life, you know, you've got 15 amazing lessons in there. And of course, one of my favorite is learn as a publisher is learn how to edit. I, I like doing that. And as you know, that was the last chapter we put in because we, you know, we were thinking we took something else to put that one in. So, yeah. But I would love for yeah. you to share a little bit, you know, about those 15 lessons and, you know, how can people um, create opportunity out of uncertainty? Well, thank you. Because, I, you know, this was, was sort of a, a dream that came around a year before that. As you know, I was I did a couple of videos for the 14th anniversary. I'm like, you know. And you and I had this conversation. It's like, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is like a book or a manuscript for somebody who, who you know, who's maybe had gone through a challenging situation, but needs some, maybe some thoughts or ideas on how to bounce back. Because the most often asked question I still get on interviews is, how did you get back on a plane after you went through a plane crash? And what I realized over the years is that question is not that question. The question is really, how did you bounce back with resiliency to be able to create an opportunity out when all this all this uncertainty was going on in your life. And that's how this all this was the dream of the genesis of the book. And, mm -hmm. and as you know, I think the, the, the overarching there's the one lesson I tell we talk about one of the chapters, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's the overarching is how to aviate, navigate, and communicate. Because I think that's mm -hmm. when people had to go through COVID, and I think I use COVID as sort of an example because everybody in the world had was affected one way or another. Yes, either we had to go through it. Or we had somebody who unfortunately had to experience it and or not make it. But the people that not only survived but thrived during it did those three things. And I learned that by, you know, I was in, actually in Orlando, Florida, talking to a captain. And he said, you know what your captain did that day? Is he said he aviated, navigated, and communicated. I'm like, what's that? And he explained it to me. And this is exactly what happened to those who uh, survived and thrived through COVID. And what we do as entrepreneurs and business people, aviate. What does aviate mean? It means keeping your plane up. So it gives you an opportunity to do, do something else. So during during that plane, that situation on the Miracle on the Hudson, the captain and the first officer had to keep the plane going until they could make a decision. Over yes. COVID, people who survived and thrived kept something going, at least kept a positive attitude, kept it going long enough to figure out, okay, what's my next move? Oh, I got to move to virtual. Okay, so aviate. Second is navigate. You got to have a game plan. You got to have a process. And that's what happened the second time on that plane. Because once he kept the plane as long as he could, he had four choices. Four choices were, I can go into, I, I, got, the, I got the ocean right here. I can put it down right here. Uh, not a good choice. Second choice was, he could have gone into Teterboro, the airport that was on the right in New Jersey. Could have. He got too many big buildings. He gets too low. Takes a building out. Not a good choice. Third option was, okay, you take it back to LaGuardia. And once you see the movie Sully, you realize that's really not a choice because it was a maybe go or no go. It could have made it or not made it. Fourth choice was the river. And then he had to use a skill set. So second point, and even like we all learned, is you got to have a game plan, a process. So first step is what? Keep your plane going. Second point is get a process. And third is communicate. 
And what communicate means is not so much externally, it's more internally with your own mind. How do you mm. talk? How do you manage your mind? And there's three three ways that you talk about managing your state. So your physiology, what you focus on, and what you have your internal representations, what you how you talk to yourself. So I think that was one of my favorite chapters because that's exactly not only what happened that day, but how I kept things going and how how people keep things going. So that, that's really one of the biggest the biggest lessons out of that. And and, and one of the other ones I, I really love to talk about is being less assuming. And you know, what's yes. that, and you know, one of the biggest lessons I learned out of the miracle on the Hudson was be less judgmental. And it came out of an episode when I was in the green room of Good Morning America with the crew and some other passengers after we were on good morning America. And one of the passengers got emotional and I quit mm. to judge him. I'm like, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, we're on national TV and we survived a plane crash. I mean, you know, pretty good stuff. And all of a sudden I found out that he had got into, was going through a divorce and he lost his job since the miracle on the Hudson. And I questioned, I said, how many times have I judged somebody so quickly? You know, mm. and, it's cost me either money, relationships, time, whatever it is. And I said, what if I could just change one thing out of this whole situation? One thing in my life is to be less judgmental, less assuming. How could that change my life? And that's the one, Kim, that opened up everything. This is why we're having this conversation today. Because all of a sudden, it's like, you know what? I'm not going to judge anybody until I know their backstory. Until I understand yeah. where they're coming from. Because I really believe what Martin Luther King said was correct. Judge people by the content of their character. And yeah, I, I, I started employing that and really working. And now I'm not perfect. Well, none of us are perfect. There's only one perfect being has ever been here. But Harry I, will attest to that. I work on that every day, Kim. And it's opened up so many doors for me because you know what? There are people like I tell people, I'll make it a little funny. I said, my dad grew up in the 30s, right? And in the yeah. 60s, when I was growing up, you see these these TV shows, you call them long haired hippie freaks. He's, you know, and he called he, he had names for everybody, right? But that was my dad, and but you can't judge him because he grew up in an era that was a certain you had certain rules, right? But you know, I look back and say, you know, what if my dad was less judgmental, maybe maybe he would have been more accepting of some of these some of these folks that you know he probably st stayed away from. So those are two of my favorite chapters. I mean, there's 13 other ones, like the editing one. I, editing really, I mean, helped me how in my life how to set boundaries. It wasn't so. Yeah, I'm really I'm so excited about this. I can't wait to uh, share this more and. Uh, the coming weeks here in uh, in Canada. Yes, because uh, actually this will have already happened by the time the episode aired, but you are going to be in Canada doing a lot of television and uh, media appearances promoting the book. So talk yeah. a little bit about that, because we do have a lot of, you know, consultants, professionals and speakers uh, who listen to this podcast. And, you know, some of them may be wondering, you know, how do you kind of get into the media? How do you get into speaking? I mean, obviously, you know, you're named one of the top. 100 leadership speakers in ink so maybe just take a few minutes and actually you know talk about that speaker side and and how did you develop it because i know many of our audience that's something that they would like to do yeah I, and, and i wasn't planning on being a speaker but i had the opportunity to speak at my church which had an enormous impact on me because i there was a lady there elderly lady who came up and after she heard me speak said I was questioning if there's a God. I don't believe in miracles, but your physical evidence, there's a God. He does miracles. And and that, you know, and she was elderly, probably in her 80s or so. And she's probably going to her great beyond somewhere in the near future. But that might, whatever I said that day had impacted her. So I knew that I had an impact, but I didn't know what I was doing. So, you know, I, I really took a couple of different approaches. Number one is I, I did what Zig Ziglar taught. And I love Zig Ziglar. I know he's what he, he was Tony Robbins or for Tony Robbins to say it that way. That's give you a point of perspective. But he said his first 70 or 80 talks he did, he did them for free. So he, he did it for rotaries and Lions clubs and chambers, churches, anybody will listen to him because he could practice his technique and perfect his performance. So I did that number one, but number two, I did what Tony recommended to me. He said, always speak from your heart. Never take a note on stage, speak from your heart and it'll come through you. So that's how I did it. I just I was just going to Red Cross events, chambers, anybody who would listen to me speak and just practice. That, that's number one. But number two on the media, see, I think everybody's got a message. And once you yeah. figure that message out, you got to figure the message out, right? 
and and you sort of got to bounce it off a few people. Fortunately, I had a mentor and a coach and people I could bounce things off of. And you're the people I bounced the book off of these some of these ideas. You've got to have have your team around you. But I think once you get that, you know what I found is the media are always looking for something positive. With all the negative stuff that's going on, they're looking for that positive message. And I think, and especially with you know people are looking for how can you share something with somebody that's helped you would help them during their challenging time. So, you know, when I'm coming to Toronto, you know, I've been doing this for you know, every year, except for the COVID years, take the COVID years out. I come to Toronto and fortunately for me that I, I have a new book, right? I usually do it around a new book, Kim. So I have something to offer, right? I can show them. And we talk about that in the lessons and because they're always looking for something. It's like, okay, Dave, we've heard your stories. It's great. We Everybody's heard of this, but yeah, you know, this, let's talk about your book and what we're talking about today. And all of a sudden, people want that. So I, th- I find that uh, it's not hard to get media. It's really not. It's just that you better have something that distinguishes you, shows that you have competence, you're creative, and you're a leader. If you do those four things, the media will usually be very open for you to be able to share your story or your mission in a way that hopefully will help them with ratings. you got to remember, it's their outcome, right? Help them yes. with ratings, but also get your message out in a way that's going to impact somebody, one of their audience. You know, Dave, that was just a great foundation that you laid there because you have to have those things in in place first. But you do also have PR people, so you're not necessarily contacting the media yourself. You you have a PR person. Now, how important would you say that is in terms of your media appearances? You know, it's interesting. At first, it was very important. It was very important because I didn't know how to approach the media. I didn't know the, how to talk to me. I didn't know how to dress. All these different things that my PR person, Ronnie, and her team have helped me greatly over the years. And, and so that's number one. They're based in Toronto, too. And I want to get into that marketplace. So it's extremely important. But now that I've been doing it for a while, people, media, media is coming to me. So I, I need somebody also to bounce that off of to make sure I, so I'm doing the right thing. See, there are certain yes. situations, as if you know of. If you read uh, read you know, my book from Turmoil to try to talk about this situation where I was actually in New Jersey and I didn't have anybody, any media expertise, any help. And there was a TV station want to interview me, but I was recommended by somebody because, you know, of my brand and the way I may be, you know, boxed in. So what I learned from that situation was I need to have somebody who has the savvy, who knows my brand and my message to make sure I'm representing the best most positive way because there are people out there. There is media out there that will take you a different direction because it's all about what they want to do. Not what you want to do, what they want to do. Yeah, You got to know that likewise. And that was one of my biggest learning experiences uh, around media. So that's why I have somebody with media experience always on my team. Now you had something very interesting happen right after the plane crash. You had a conversation with Tony Robbins because um, you were working with him at that time. Talk about that because that was something that was really critical that helped you in the days and the months ahead, um, especially as you started to gain more attention. Yeah, I was in the hospital. I didn't have a phone. My BlackBerry, yes, BlackBerry friends. I had a BlackBerry and it was at the bottom of the Hudson. So I had nothing, but you know, I was the head of security for Tony and I traveled all the time with him. So but, you know, I wasn't thinking about Tony Robbins at that point. I'm very, I wasn't thinking about Tony. I was just thinking about recovery. But he, uh, he through his, his contacts, found me in the hospital. And probably 10, 9, 10 o'clock, 10.30 that night, I had a conversation with Tony. And if you go to YouTube, you can actually see the video of, from that. It says, Tony Robbins praises Dave Sanderson. It was, a, it was about a 10-minute conversation. And I shared some things that happened. He shared with me some mindset. And, but most importantly, what he, you know, what he did is, yeah, he gave me reassurance. That, you know what? You, you did good. You did the right thing. You took care. You took care of other people first. He said, "Now let other people take care of you." And that's what that happened. But the last thing he said to me is, "When you get to Los Angeles, give me a call. I want to share some thoughts with you." So, you know, at the end of that conversation, when he said that, I remembered it. So when I went to, I was going to Los Angeles to do those some interviews with you know Bonnie Hunt and Dr. Phil and all that stuff. I called him. And he gave me th- about two and a half, three hours of time on the phone. And he was talking with me through the mindset that's going to happen, what to lo- look out for, what I need to do. 
how I need to start looking to do this with my own thing. He was giving me a doctoral on the mindset it's going to take to be able to serve people at a different level. And that, you know, I, 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 I bless Tony for that because, you know, he took his time, which is the most valuable thing he's, and we all have his time to help make sure I was supported because he saw me doing the right thing. So just do the right thing. And more often than not, it's going to come back to you tenfold some way. And that was a gift to me. And I, I think too, I remember from some of our conversations was, you know, one of the things that Tony did was he did warn you, like, you know, as, as you got out there more, as people started to get to know your name, he gave you some really sage advice on some of the do's, some of the don'ts, what to look out for, what to prioritize, not what to fall for. You know, he really helped to guide you through that, that time period because you were gaining a lot of attention, but you were also gaining people who didn't like the fact that you were getting all this attention. So maybe speak to that a little bit, because I think that's something that, you know, us as entrepreneurs, consultants, professional speakers, you know, when we finally do start to get that attention, I don't think we're always ready for some of the negative um, consequences that can happen, you know, when you do become popular and seen and noticed. You know, that, you know, that was some of the best advice I had received from him. Because there is, a, like you said, there's going to be a threshold point. There's going to be a threshold point where, you know, you know, you're doing everything you think is right, but somebody's going to take that and interpret that a different way. And I had, I've had some people in the past that took it a different way. I said, you shouldn't be receiving this kind of notoriety. You shouldn't be doing this. You know, and it's like they were coming down on me hard. And it's like I didn't understand at first, but then I remember what Tony said. It's like, you know what? You know, everybody's got to deal with their own stuff, right? That's not my stuff. That's their stuff on how they represent it. So the, the, one of the things he told me to do, and he recommended this, and if you, there's a little thing in the back there next to the globe that someone actually put it on, nice little thing for me. He said, always stay humble. Always have humility. Yeah. He said, if you do that, it doesn't matter what everybody else says because you're coming from your heart first and it'll always come through. So once he told me that and when all the, some, of the, some of the things were coming down in a different direction at me, I just said, you know what? It's, I... I'm not going to respond to it. I'm not going to respond to it because let them be haters. Let somebody else, because they're not, they see somebody else getting a little bit of notoriety. You know, my notoriety is because I'm trying to do something good and help, help maybe raise money for the Red Cross. But some mm. people, even the Red Cross, uh, I'm easy pickings. So you, I think it, there's ways and ways you got to respond. And sometimes one of the things my mother always says, sometimes you just don't respond. You just keep your yeah. head down, focus on your mission. And you know what? And, and she was right. And my, my first boss in sales was right. He told me the same thing. Give it 24 to 48 hours and watch what happens. It goes away. And I write, I write about that in my books. Sometimes you just let it go away, right? Because it doesn't get any energy from you. So true. Now, Dave, before we, we actually get to talking about, you know, writing and publishing your books, there's something that you've done in the years since that I think some people know about, but not everybody knows. You have actually swung, sw ah, swam the Hudson River. So talk about that because I loved it when we were working on your book and you, you know, you talked about the water giving you life. Yep. Yeah. And then, you know, it's uh, one of the things I talk about now is how to face your fears. And I wasn't planning on going back in the Hudson River. I already had my shot. I already did my swim. I'm good. But yeah, I was actually standing in the airport in Newark. The airport's right across the river in Newark uh, airport. And I was standing there. My, my friend, who now is my wingman, called and said, would you want to swim with me? You want to swim with me with the Navy SEALs, you know, in, from New Jersey, New York. And maybe he'll give you some redemption. Maybe he'll give you some redemption. And I had to think hard, long and hard, Kim, because, you know, it's been 40 years since I swam, like, swam anything. But I did, and I went back in. I committed to go in first to raise money for those, those uh, Navy SEAL vests who had fallen on hard times. That was the reason, but that wasn't the only reason. You know, the other reason was, is number two, I wanted to show my kids primarily how to face your fears, how you got to go back, and when you hit, when something hits you in the face, you got to turn the other cheek, and you got to go, you got to face it. So I, I spent, it took me 100 days, but in 100 days, I went from basically swimming 25 meters to 3.1 miles with the, the elite of the elite. But that's not the story. 
that's cool. And yeah, it takes a lot of fortitude and resilience. I talk about there's game plans. That's good stuff. But the real story happened on the last leg. Because when I was swimming from with Suzanne, my wingman, from Ellis Island to New York City, which is about 1.1 miles to that point point, just give you some perspective, across the Hudson River, we're about 600 meters out from New York City. I, I swam, I took left, and I saw the, where the plane crashed. I saw it. I could see it. I knew exactly where it was because it was right down from the Intrepid where we had the event. Uh, and that, so I saw that and I stalled. And I tell people, it's not good to stall in 70 feet water. Right? You, you want to keep moving, right? But I stalled. Yes. I pulled on my little buoy. And she said, like, you all right? I'm like, you know what? I said, I, detected at the front door. I said, I love you, Suzanne. And she said, yell back, I love you too. And that was the moment I realized this whole thing is about gratitude. It's about gratitude. Yeah. It's about giving thanks to something bigger than yourself, you know, and, and it takes a lot of people to be able to do something of the magnitude of what happened. And it takes a lot of, a lot of mindset. We talk about discipline and consistency, be able to go face your fears. So I want to really make that point. It's like, you know, this whole thing is not only what happened on January 15, 2009, but going back gave me not only the certainty that I could step up and do something at my age to show people, listen, age is just a number. The second if you have gratitude, you can ha- you don't have any fear. You cannot have fear if you have gratitude because you're giving thanks. And as you know, what I talk about, the more gratitude you give, the more grace that you get. The more grace that you get, the more opportunity you have, not only to serve, but have that, that, that f- happy and fulfilling life that uh, I think all of us are wanting that uh, God has is, God is laid in front of us. But we have to do our part, too. We have to do our part. Uh, you know what, Dave? I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know... <sighs> And and you put it in such a way I've 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 heard you say it, but just something clicked here today. And you know, it's the fact that gratitude and fear can't be in the same place at the same time. Yeah, I mean, look, look what happened to Jesus on the cross. He had gratitude. He knew he was coming. He tried. He told God, "Yeah, take me out of this, right?" But he knew he was here for a reason, and he gave thanks to his Creator, his God, our God, and ultimately, good came out of it, right? Because yeah. I'm sure he had some thoughts. I mean, you know, come on. I mean, he was going through a lot of pain. I mean, and I think I, I don't know if I told you a story, but I was on the on the church council or our executive board for a number of years at our church. And we were at one meeting, and it got, I'm sure it doesn't happen at your church, Kim, but our church got a little contentious. All right. There's some people having little uh debates. And I was like sitting there going, I'm 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 not following all this. So I looked at Ken, who was our minister. I said, Ken. I said, I'm sure every day in Jesus' life was a pixie, pixie dust and sunshine. I said, what did Jesus do when stuff like this broke out? He goes, he went outside and prayed. He said he always prayed and gave great thanks to his father, which brought calm. I said, you know what? What a great metaphor, right? You just take a moment when you're going through all those challenging times. Say, you know what? Maybe I'll just take 30 seconds to say thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, you have some gratitude. And all of a sudden, all this energy dissipates and you can focus on what's truly important. And the one thing is truly important as I think you believe, whether anybody else believes it is this it's glorifying God. Yeah. 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 Oh, we've unpacked a lot today already there, Dave. And I yeah. think we could, we could definitely do a deep dive, but I want to, I do want to talk a little bit about your book because um you know, it was such a wonderful experience getting to work with you on two of the books from Turmoil from yeah, Turmoil to Triumph and The Limitless Life. But, you know, I want to talk a little bit, you know, about that process of writing books for you, because we, we did it very collaboratively um, on both books. But I would, there's a question I ask every single author that comes on the show. So I'm going to ask you the question and then we'll, we'll dive into it a bit. So what has been the good, the bad and the ugly about writing, editing and publishing books? Yeah. So let's always start with the positive, right? One of the great things about writing your own book is I made a determination on Moments Matter and from Turmoil to Triumph and The Limitless Life to self-publish. That way I can control my story because I had other people. As you know, we had this discussion. I had people who wanted to publish the book. I, I, I didn't want to lose control. I wanted to make sure that my story is my story. And where I learned this from is on the first book that I actually wrote a chapter from Brace to 
We have Race for Impact. Is During that time, Kim, there was another book being written called The Miracle on the Hudson. And they came to me. And they wanted me to do the same thing. And at first, I was very excited. I right? go, ooh, someone wanted to. But then what they said is I had, I had a contract that said for one year, you can't tell this story. Basically, the books, the story, we can't go out and tell your story. I'm like, what? I've already told my story. Yeah. No, no. So I learned that if I could self-publish, the great thing about it is if I write it, I self-publish it, I can control at least the outcome. Now, the bad side is, is something we learned on the first book, is – we had a deadline on the first book, Moments Matter, and we had one on the second book too, but we learned our lesson because the first book's deadline was January 15th, right, of 2016. As I tried to publish right around the anniversary, and we had it done, all was, it was all written, right? And Cindy and I are collaborating. I, I'm dictating, she's writing, we're doing all this, but we had a big book launch in New, New Jersey. In fact, there was a billboard on the Lincoln Tunnel about the book launch. I mean, all over. I mean, it was a, unbelievable. So we had to get the book. So what did we do? We forgot. We didn't edit it. We just got it out there. And all of a sudden, we got it out there. It was great. They had a lot of pub, you know publicity and all super until I had people writing me and texting me and texting, sending me all these mistakes. I'm like, wow. You know, because we skipped a critical step called editing. So... <laughs> Because we had a commitment. So the bad thing is don't make a commitment unless you can live up to that commitment and make sure it's all, all your I's are dotted and T's are crossed. And so, you know, on the second book, which you were, I had it edited three times, you know, you were the third editor. Cause I'm like, I learned my lesson. I learned my lesson. And as you know, you found things from the second edit and the first edit, we still need to edit. Right. So I learned that lesson. So that's the bad, good. And the bad, the ugly side is, is, you know, and I don't think it's ugly personally, but you got to push it yourself. And, you know, but you know what? Well, if people say, well, you get a publisher, they'll do it for you. You know, they'll do it to, for you for a point, to a point. But I also learned is this, is if you collaborate with other organizations, they will help you. So the ugly actually yes. around, because that's when I said, you know what? Every, I, I donated a percentage of every copy of Moments Matter and Turmoil to Triumph to the Red Cross. And then they, they were very kind in not only purchasing the book, but publicizing the book for me around the country and North America. So, yeah, there's good, bad, and ugly. And I've seen the ugly side, too. I've had people who've gone to publishers who could not get their rights back. And all of a sudden, mm -hmm. the story is the way, not the story they really wanted to tell. It was edited to the point where that's how they thought they were going to sell books, because that's what a publisher does. They sell books. Me, I want to get the message out. I want to control it. Selling some books is great, but it's more about using this as sort of a, as, as a, as a calling card or a, you know, here's my story and here's some more insights that you're not going to get from me unless you read this book. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when you first came to me through Larry Levine and audience, if you've been on the show for any length of time, you know, Larry, uh, I talk about him often. And, uh, you know, if you want to know more about Larry and selling from the heart, that's episode 427. Uh, but I, I do remember when you first came and, and you gave me your book and we were looking at it and I'm like, OK, like we've got to. You know, we've got to do a lot of work on this. And so when we started The Limitless Life, you know, you and I had those conversations. Okay, here's the timeline. Here's the expectations. Here's what got to be done. And then it's like, Dave, we got to get started. Dave, I know you're yep. busy, but if you want this book yep. for the 15th anniversary, we have to get started. Yep. And I think, you know, when, when you're looking at doing a book, um, one of the things you talk about a lot is, is coaching and mentorship. And so, yes, it's going to be speaking about me a little bit, but can you talk about, you know, because you've worked with a couple of different publishers, you know, what was some of the benefits of, of working, you know, with a publisher to be able to get your book out and the right publisher? Cause I think that's important too. Like you and I, before we ever work together we had conversations we we made sure that we were a good fit for each other before you wanted to make sure that i understood your message you know that i was going to be able to keep to timelines for me i wanted to make sure that you were going to be the type of person that i partnered with right mm -hmm. you weren't just hiring me we were going to be partnering together to get your message out yep and i think thank you for that because you know 
I'll take it sort of one level deeper um, because one of the things that I did when I was in business working for companies as a leader and what I do in my team, little team right now, and I still do it today is, you know, what's most important to me. Uh, there's three things that are really important, but there's one more one on the end that's more important. First, uh, you know, do you, can you, do you have the confidence to be able to pull it off? Do you have that? Second, do you have the competence to do it? Mm-hmm. And third, I need somebody who's creative who's going to get think out of the box. The fourth is the one that I, that I is the, is the determining factor for me. Is are you a cultural fit with me and my team? Because all these three things can be great, but if you can't culturally fit in my team, or I can't culturally fit into what your process is, it's not going to work. It doesn't really matter. So when we were having those discussions, that's what I was digging for. I knew you were competent. Because, you know, Larry, I took Larry's recommendation. You did with Larry. Okay. She's competent. She's creative. I like I like some of the ideas that you had. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, you seem confident. But you know what? I'll take that as a fact because Larry said that she did it. She did. She backed up what she said she was going to back up. But the real question was, can I can Kim fit into my little world? Can I fit into Kim's little world? So once that was established, then it was like, okay, can, can we get it on time? And, and, and the first one, as you know, it was more about taking all these different uh, – I wrote every word of that book, as you know, every word. And it's been edited twice, but I knew it needed to be edited a third time because I learned my lesson from Moments Matter. I learned my lesson, right? I may be stupid, but I ain't dumb, right? I learned my lesson. So you you gave me some creative ideas on how to do – put it together. So I knew that. So when I was doing the fourth, fourth book, which is my third total of just myself, The Limitless Life, you know, I had the concept – but then you and I, I, I trusted you enough because the cultural fit to collaborate with you. Say, you know what? I got these 15 lessons and you knew that I recorded 15 lessons, right? I recorded all but one of those lessons are in this book. The other one is not in this called the editing chapter. because That was the last one in. But you say, you know what? We got this. I think we got a book, Kim. So I trusted based on our cultural fit that you could figure out how could we structure this in a way to get it done. And. And you knew, because this is discussion number one. Oh, by the way, the 15th anniversary is about 10 months from now, right? <laughs> we get this thing done. And yes, the first month or so was slow sledding and probably causing me. But then you you gave me something which Lisa, who's my operation manager, is and basically always on me about. Follow the process. Just follow the process. Yeah. And once we start following the process, it all fell into place, right? So that's what I would tell people. I was like, you know, you know, there's a person, does your publisher give you confidence that they can do it? Do they have the confidence they have done it? Are they creating enough to put you, sort of set you apart? But fourth, can they culturally fit? So the, the, the other big publishers who approached me didn't have number four. They had the first three. They didn't have number four, yeah. right? That's the distinguishing factor, cultural fit. You know, and, and it's the same for me. Um, I have actually turned away clients because – you know, I didn't feel the synergy. I didn't feel that we fitted with each other. I, you know, there was one person in particular, I could not represent his message. What he wanted to talk about ethically was against, you know, what I believed. I could not, I could not write his book. And so I think, you know, an important lesson here is you know, not just even with publishing, but, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, as a consultant, professional speaker, um, there are going to be times when the best answer that you can give is no. It's a gift. It, it's actually uh, showing respect to somebody else <clears throat> to make sure that they have time and have the effort to go find somebody who is a better fit. Because, you know, how many times in our lives have we gone with somebody or have, that can't like, this is it's not going to work, but we try to make it work, but it doesn't work. And so you've doubled or tripled your effort. So like Stephen Covey says, right? Sharpen the saw one time, right? <laughs> Don't keep sawing, sharpen it, right? Sharpen the saw and get, make sure it's right the first time because then you can cut it easily instead of having to cut, cut, cut. And by the way, it's not cutting. I wonder why it's not cutting. You know? Oh, well, Dave, we are almost at the hour point. So I think we're going to start tying this up. Um, 
first of all, audience, if you've enjoyed this conversation, you want to check out Dave's books. They are all available on Amazon. Uh, so Moments Matter, From Turmoil to Triumph, uh, The Limitless Life, all the three of those, you can get them on Amazon. Um, Dave, just as we, we close out, you know, I would love for one final thought from you. And then how can people connect with you? Because you know what? I'm sure that there was a lot that was stirred up today. I know you're you're very active on LinkedIn um, and you post a lot there, but how can people connect with you? Yeah, thank you. I mean, LinkedIn would be ideal because that's where I put my new content out every week. As you know, I write I write a blog or an article every week so I can share some new content with people. So LinkedIn's great uh, for that kind of, if you want to connect with me, I always connect with back very quickly or the, my website at davesandersonspeaks.com where as most people are always in constant upgrading, but you can check out some of my new content there, my books, my new videos, some of the new topics that I'm really delving into. And, and also one thing I'll, I'll offer to everybody is, you know, because I, I appreciate you being a part of my magazine and I have my own magazine called moments matter. And, you know, every quarter we do a new edition. And if you go to my website at Dave Sanderson speaks.com, go to the, it says books and magazines, go to magazines. You can, get the, a digital free copy of the digital magazine, or if you give, if not give us your name and uh, address, we'll send you a physical copy. Likewise, if you like to do it that way to have a physical copy, but Kim was so kind to be a part of our magazine a couple quarters ago. And it's a, uh, it's amazing um, how this one little magazine is being able to, be able to expose so many other people's stories about the moment in their life that changed them, that triggered them. And that's what my, my magazine's about. And, you know, it's one of the things I learned from being with Tony. If you want to be outstanding, you got to stand out. You got to do something different. And a magazine allows me to be able to promote other people and what they do so people can see it does. It's, it's, it's one moment. It's not a life, mm. life, lifetimes of made of moments. It's just one moment everything triggers for somebody. And it's, that's what changes the direction and destiny of our lives. And that's what Moments Matter, the magazine, is about. So check it out on my website, likewise, and get a free digital copy. The next edition is coming out later this week, Kim. So we'll already be out, audience, by the time that you are listening to us. And Dave, I was very deeply honored that um, you allowed me to talk about the power of words. And, you know, there were two moments, a very negative moment that defined my life for 30 years. And then a moment when I redefined that first moment and was able to move forward in life. So thank you for letting me share that story. Well, well thank you for being I'm honored that you, you because I know it takes time and effort and there are specification in any book you got specifications right so i know but i appreciate that and you know one of the things i made a commitment for every edition just if everybody knows give some perspective every edition will have a canadian every edition will have somebody from the military the uh, canadian is dove baron for this quarter from vancouver and my um uh, my military person her her call sign is may she is the first female uh air force thunderbird point pilot uh so if I, as International Women's Month, I want to honor her and, and her military service. And so check it out. Everyone's got a Canadian and a military person to thank them for the service. Well, Dave, you know I'm Canadian, so you know I always appreciate. Yep. Uh, You're your... my Canadian that one quarter, Kim. You're my Canadian that quarter. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, Dave, I have a Canadian Olympic coach I want to introduce you to. I think you would love his story. So remind me about that. And I'm going to introduce you to uh, another one of my favorite people. Well, audience, it's that time again. If you've reached this point, it's been an, uh, a double long episode this time, but packed full of value. But um, I would love to redirect you to the 400th episode. If you want to find out more about the Author to Authority podcast, how it came to be, uh, it, I, I had my dear friend John Lusher interview me for the 400th. So uh, I didn't lead the podcast. He led and I got <laughs> interviewed for it. So if you are watching and you're on YouTube, you know the routine. The thumbnail is here somewhere. Uh, my daughter does put the thumbnail up. I'm just not always sure where. And if you're on your favorite podcast app, well, if we're at the 500 and you're going back to 400, you are definitely going to be you know, using that finger to scan back. But I guarantee you that if you want to find out more about the Author to Authority episode, ah, Author to Authority podcast, that's one of the best episodes to do it. Well, audience, thank you so much. 
Dave, it has been an honor and a pleasure having you here on the show. And we will see you on the very next episode. Bye now.